Hi, my name is Andy, and this is a video about Java 8, what you get in Java 8 that you didn't have in Java 7. I kind of feel like I ought to do some videos about what you get in Java 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, because uh, I'm sure there's loads of stuff I've missed from in there. But anyway, there's some exciting stuff in Java 8, if you like that kind of thing. So, uh, it's all. we're going to talk about how it's all about functional stuff, uh, in particular uh, lambdas and being able to refer to methods. Uh, we're also going to briefly look at the optional thing and streams, which are again to do with um, uh, making functional styles more accessible. Uh, default methods let you write code in interfaces. Some more stuff, some stuff I like, I don't like, and I really don't like. And that's it. So, um, Java 8 is all about adding functional capabilities um, to Java, basically taking features from other languages, especially things like Scala and Clojure that have kind of shown that you can get a benefit from uh, working in a functional way um, on the JVM. And basically people have been yelling and shouting at Java for ages um, for doing everything wrong and have and functional is better. Um, if you've watched any of my other videos you probably realize that I often do think that functional is better. Um, a brief idea of what, what functional programming means. Um, in general terms, it means writing your code as functions that don't uh, do anything to the outside world and don't uh, listen to anything from the outside world. They only listen to their arguments uh, and return a value, and that's all they do. And if you write all your code in that style, uh, it's just easier to understand. You don't have to figure out what state something was in before you started and then what state it's changed to afterwards. And anyone who's worked with large Java programs um, we'll know that that can be a problem understanding what what state you've got into before you even get to this bit of code. If you write in functional style, um, you just never have that problem. Um, so, uh, uh, but if you write in functional style, there's a few things that you need that can help you make life a lot easier. Uh, and Java 8 gives you some of those things. So it gives you the ability to talk about a function and pass it as an argument uh, into another function. This is something that if you've done any JavaScript or anything like that, uh, you'll be very familiar with. Um, but in Java, it hasn't been possible until now. And it, in a way, it's not possible. It's still not possible in Java, but it just works as if it is. So it's almost almost good enough. Um, uh, it's also more support for uh, immutable data, by which I mean stuff that can't change, um, which is very important in functional programming. You can you want to be able to talk about things uh, that don't change. You know, it's this thing about state not changing underneath you. Um, you you want data structures that you know can't change. Um, so there's more support for that, uh, and there's more support for a, a streaming style, which basically means um, if you've heard of map reduce or um, uh, any of that stuff, it's it's where data flows through um, function. Oh, I just I'll just show you. It'll be easier. Okay, so. Um, uh, landers are the big headline feature, and that's to do with uh, these passing functions as values. It's a convenient syntax um, for defining uh, a function without providing the whole class stuff all around it. And actually underneath Java kind of put, puts all that class stuff all around it, you don't have to care about it. So here's an example. Um, we make a list called words um, from strings, so it's a list of strings called words. Um, there should, that should be list diagonal bracket string. I think my uh, formatting's got messed up. Um, and then we call sort, um, which is, this is from java.util.collections.sort. I've just done a static import to make it look nicer. Um, and we say, I, I want you to sort words, uh, and I'm going to use this stuff in red as the uh, comparison, um, or rather the, um, the key that you use to um, compare them by. So uh, if you return a smaller number that something comes earlier in the list, I think it is, or the other way around. Um, so we're defining a function here, that um, bracket s1, s2, and then the arrow symbol, um, and then the rest, that is um, a function, we haven't defined the return type, we haven't declared the return type or the types of the arguments, um, and Java's just worked them out. So basically you can make a little function. Um, before Java 8 you would have had to write You'd have to make an instance of an interface uh, in order to do this. It would have taken quite a lot more lines of code. Um, and when you do that, you get them sorted uh, in reverse order. So yeah, it looks like I was right about keys being smaller coming first. Um, 
So that's the first thing. So just being able to refer to, uh, just being able to define a function inline like that, like the red code there, that's called a lambda function. Um, and the other thing you can do is refer to existing methods um, and pass them as arguments into functions as well. So there's this this uh, new method called comparing int defined on comparator, and that takes in a uh, a method like we, in this case the length method on string, and it will apply length to whatever um, object it, it, uh, it it's it's using. So it basically what comparing int does is returns a comparator that takes in uh, strings and compares them using the string dot length function or whichever function you pass into it. So in this case, the string dot length function. So again, uh, when we run this code, whoops, when we run this code, we get the same output. It, it'll sort those strings by length. Um, and what's interesting here is that string colon colon length, which is the way of referring to a method, that isn't a static method. That's an actual instance method on a string. So you're able to pass in a reference to an instance method when you haven't got an instance yet of a string um, and then comparing int is able to use that um, method on the instances that it gets as it tries to compare the various strings in that code. Make any sense? Okay, uh, so what's the syntax for lambdas? Well you've seen it already but here's a few more ways of doing syntax. Basically anything with the magic arrow in, is that's a symbol that Java didn't know about before so um, it's been uh, used to uh, signify a lambda function. Uh, you can have a lambda function with no arguments by doing the bracket bracket and then the arrow. You can put brackets around the arguments, uh, or you can miss them out if there's only um, one argument. Is that right? I think so, yeah. Um, and on the left-hand side of each of these lines, you can see um, it also uh, coming in this in the standard library in, in Java is a way of talking about these uh, functions uh, so that you can accept them as arguments. So if you were, if you wanted to accept something like that bracket bracket arrow 4 plus 3, the first function there, if you wanted to be able to take in an argument like that, you the the parameter that you would um, ask for would be an int supplier. So basically an int supplier is, some, is a function that takes in no arguments and returns an int. Um, and, then, and there are other things like int function which takes in an int and returns an int and so on. Uh, and there's others like these binary operators. I've shown you the int versions, but there are also generic versions for um, for classes. These int ones are, are because int is not a class, so it has to um, you have to have special ones for that. Which is one of the wrinkles. Uh, okay, so the question is, why would you want to do this stuff at all? So, first reason, uh, convenience, um, uh, especially for things like listeners. We, we're all used to writing quite a lot of boilerplate code in our Java in order just to make a little listener or, or something like that. You have to implement an interface, uh, make an instance somewhere and pass it into an argument like this. Um, and actually that stuff was just crying out for a li just a little lambda function. I, here you can see there's no brackets around the E and that's still allowed syntax. Um, but this is a little lambda function that just does something based on an event called E and you can just pass in that lambda into the add action listener method uh, and it implements an interface. So the way this works underneath is um, any any argument or any any um, type which is um, which is an interface which only has one method defined in it, then that can be satisfied by defining a lambda function. So this add action listener method, I'm pretty sure, already existed in Java 7 and it asks for an interface presumably action listener or something like that and that interface only has one method on it and anywhere where there's an interface that only has one method on it only requires you to implement one method instead of providing an instance of that interface you can just provide a lambda like this and the lambda will be considered to be implementing the one method of that interface so here we can just pass in what we want to do and it's starting to look a bit more like the code we would write in Groovy or something that is uh, a little bit less verbose. Uh, another reason why, so that was convenience, the next one is elegance. So it, um, it, you've probably written quite a lot of loops that loop through all the words in a list or uh, or filter out everything except odd numbers or you know whatever, things like that. So um, by allowing this style of programming we can 
implement that stuff once and not have to re-implement it every time we do it. So here's just a very simple example. Instead of writing a for loop like we've all done a million times, uh, lists now have this method on them called for each, and it just does um, calls whatever method you give it inside um, for for each of the um, items in the list. So in this case, we're providing it with the static no, not static method, but the uh, bound instance method println. So we're giving it not just println here, but a println bound to out, which means it, it already knows it already knows where to print to. Um, so we're giving it out dot in, in yeah okay I won't go into that anyway point is we're giving it this thing called println which is ready to be called with an argument and then each of the arguments um, each of the items in the list are used as an argument one by one and then you can see they get printed out below okay so what I'm saying is that's more elegant than having to write your own for loop every time and if it's just a for loop uh, that might not be a very strong argument, but um, if you're writing more logic, like filtering things out and all kinds of things like that, which we'll get to with the streaming stuff, um, the elegance of this is is clear because you don't have to constantly write the same code over and over, which you you previously did have to do in quite a few cases in Java. And here's an example of something that you couldn't really do before in Java. So this this is the power of being able to pass uh, methods. Uh, or functions into uh, other functions or other methods. Um, so this is an example that I've um, I've played with before, and I've moaned about Java specifically before. In my, in my videos about Scheme Lisp, I talked about um, I talked about how you would do something in a whole load of different languages, one of which was Java. And the something that I wanted to do as an example was I wanted to kind of make a new a new thing that's a bit like if, but instead of just saying uh, kind of yes or no. I wanted to say if x is less than zero, do something. If x is equal to zero, do something else. And if x is greater than zero, do something else. So it's like a three-state if instead of an if which only has the two options. Um, and I was showing in in that video in that in Scheme, you can kind of write your own bits of language that um, that do this kind of stuff, and it's very nice. Um, in Java, you can't do that. You don't have macros. But what you do have in Java 8 is the ability to do something like what you might do in Python or JavaScript, which is pass in a function and then call it based on the value of x. So all we're doing here is I've written a function called 3state, which takes in this, this x, and if x is 0, it calls its first, its second argument, which is the one you can see there, the lambda function, which prints out 0. Uh, and if x is positive, it calls its third argument, and if x is negative, it calls its fourth argument. I think I could be an example. Yeah, so uh, you can see how, uh, that running there. If you pass in 2, it prints out positive. If you pass in 0, it prints out 0, and so on. So only point is, this, um, this you might or might not think this is a useful thing to be able to do in a program. Uh, it depends on what program you're writing, I guess. But the point is, by, being, by allowing you to pass functions in, um, you get... The, you get the ability to kind of make up your own language a little bit more than you had in Java before. It's a little bit uh, closer to what you can do in some a really powerful language like Scheme, uh, and it catches up with what you can do in things like Python and JavaScript uh, and Ruby. And uh, what was I going to say about that? Um, yeah, it, previously you would you can do this in Java, but you had to define an interface which had three methods on it, uh, or or reuse that interface three times for the three arguments. And then you'd have to implement the interface with the three different methods for zero, positive, and negative. And it was pages of code, and you just wouldn't bother. You'd just write the if every time, you know, if x is less than zero, do this. Um, because it's just less typing and less um, less, less wasted thinking. Uh, but now you have a genuine way of taking that logic, putting it somewhere, giving it a name, which is this three underscore state thing, and then reusing it. So I, I say that's better. Okay, other things you get in Java 8, you get optional. Uh, and what optional does is it um, it allows you to declare explicitly that an object might be null or might not be. And in itself that's useless because all things, all references could be null uh, or could not be. Um, but if you if you use it along with the annotation not null, at not null, uh, that means that you can be sure that some things are not null. And if you use it along with a coding convention, which means that you 
you specify nothing is ever null unless it's in an optional, then it might get you somewhere. So what this is trying to do is catch up with languages which have this stuff built in, where basically um, nothing is ever null unless it's inside an optional where it's allowed to be null. And you can keep track of what might be null or what might not be null uh, using that. Uh, Java's trying to catch up with that. To some extent it doesn't work because um, you uh, everything could be null, but if you stick to this coding convention of stuff is not null unless I say it's optional, it may get you somewhere, especially if you use the at not null annotation. Anyway, here's an example. When we call um, get on a map and pass in a key, we might get back a null or we might not. So if we construct an optional object using optional dot of nullable, that just makes us an optional object, um, then that that kind of notes down for us that that thing might be null or might not be null, so it's kind of safe to deal with it from then on. Um, and then on that optional object, I'm also showing you as part of this example, you can call the or else method. And um, what that basically does is if there's nothing in this optional thing, if it is null, it will it will return missing. Uh, but if there is something in this optional thing, um, it will return the thing that's in there. So I can uh, I can write code where I, I get stuff out of a map, but it, but then um, uh, it, I get back missing instead if there's nothing in, under that key. Okay, so that's optional, and that um, as I say, it's of theoretical interest if you're writing a new code base or you're prepared to go through your whole code base, change everything to use optional where it should, uh, and make sure nothing's ever null unless it's wrapped up in optional. Um, but that seems that seems a pretty big thing to do um, compared with a language where this is actually enforced, which I think. Is a lot more useful. Okay, streams. So streams are what I was talking about before. They're kind of reusable ways of reusing logic that you would previously have had to write a for loop for um, or something like that. So um, you've got a list of words like we've been dealing with before. Um, but now uh, this list has this method on it called stream and uh, that gives you um, a whole load of other stuff that you can do to that stream. So you can call map which basically modifies everything in that stream of things that's coming through so stream kind of turns it into a kind of stream of stuff that you're you're operating on um, so if you call map you can then call a function for everything in that list so here we're saying take in s and return open quote s close quote comma um, so we're basically wrapping things up in um, quotes and, and comma separating them and then we can call reduce and what reduce does is it combines together all the elements of the list and eventually only ends up with one thing so that reduce function says start off with the empty string and then for every pair of elements that you're dealing with so you start off with the empty string plus the first thing in the list then you just stick them together and then then now you've got the first thing in the list on its own because you could just combine it with the empty string so now you combine it with the next thing in the list so then you get so you started off with foo comma and now you've got foo comma q comma and then you combine it with the third thing in the list you end up with foo comma q comma ba comma so you can see at the bottom what the output of this program is um, and basically map and reduce are kind of commonly understood um, uh, functions in functional programming that operate on streams of things or lists of things uh, so basically in Java you can now do that kind of working and there's all kinds of other operations that are known like filter which basically picks some elements of the list and not others and you'll notice that this stuff would be absolutely agony to work with if you didn't have lambda functions but now because you've got lambda functions you can write code that's fairly easy to understand this this is it does this to each element in the list and then it sticks the elements together like that um, so these things work these things come together uh, other things you can do with streams, you can make infinite streams. So this stream.iterate says start with a 1 and then to get the next uh, element in this stream uh, take in the previous one and add 1 to it. And then we're doing dot .limit which basically um, says stop after 4 items and then we're saying for each of those um, print them out. So Yep, so you can have infinite streams, which is um, quite hard to get your head around, uh, but it can be really useful for stuff if you, as you get familiar with functional programming, it makes more sense. Uh, other things you can do, yeah, filter, like I was saying, so we, we limited it to the first seven things, but then we're filtering them so that um, only even ones come out. So that's an example of using filter. Again, it takes in a lander and tells you 
Should I accept this element? Yes or no, based on the return value of that lambda function. Okay, so why would you do streams? Um, because your code's cleaner, you're not um, you're not having to rewrite the same logic over and over. Um, you've got logic like filter and reduce. It's written for you. You know it's correct. Um, and uh, streams are, can operate on immutable data very effectively as well, um, which means that you don't have to worry about what's changing underneath you, as I was saying. Um, yeah, don't have to rewrite filter map reduce. Um, and uh, if you write your code in a streaming style, you can often get uh, parallel uh, execution for free. So instead of using a stream, you could use like a parallel stream or something like that. And for your map function, for example, which does something to each element, well, those that that stuff could it, theoretically each call to that function could happen on a completely different computer or different thread or different CPU or something, and you wouldn't have to know about it. They could all just happen without you knowing. So, if someone implements parallel streams uh, that work nicely, you will just be able to use them for free without changing your code, except to say use a parallel stream instead of an ordinary stream. Um, and that's in principle, that's been proved to be highly effective. The reason why MapReduce is famous is because uh, Google and, and subsequently Hadoop have shown that you can get massive parallelism using by writing code in that style, writing it in a map and then a reduced style. Um, you get you, you can you can you know be as fast as Google in theory. <clears throat> okay, um, other things you get uh, uh, in interfaces, you can now have code now, this is brilliant because this is really useful for um, sharing um, functionality across classes that don't have any um, they don't really have anything in common they just need the same bit of code in them so for example in the iterable interface the in the Java library they've added um, actual code to an iterable which is this for each method that we've already seen being used um, and the keyword is default you put default before the um, method instead of just being able to say uh, things that implement this interface have to provide this method you can actually provide some code and what that means is if people don't implement this method they get this code and if they do they get their own code so very similar to um, a virtual method in a class the particular reason why this is useful in uh, Java 8 is they needed it because they wanted a whole load of code in these interfaces but they also wanted the interfaces only ever to have one method that you need to implement, so they can be used as lambdas. Um, so anywhere where there's another method in an interface, they, if they provide code for it, then that thing can still be used as a lambda because there's still only one method that you have to implement. So if you only if you provide a lambda, it assumes you wanted the default for all the others, um, and then that lambda for that one method that has to be implemented. Uh, anyway, this is incredibly useful. You can imagine you would you could use this for all kinds of things where previously people might have used aspect-oriented programming or something like that. Okay, other miscellaneous things that have been added in Java 8 just for completeness. Um, there's been a change to the garbage collection, so there's, there's no longer a generation called the permanent generation. Instead, all the static data about classes and stuff uh, go on the heap, which means it's more flexible. Uh, you can share memory between that and the actual program memory. If you make a whole load of classes, then um, you're not going to run out of memory that's just for classes, you just run out of normal memory. Um, there is now an implementation of base64 encoding in the standard library, which is brilliant because you don't have to go and find one from somewhere else, which has been great pain for me. Um, there's uh, extended annotations, including at read only, which um, is, I think, from what I've seen of it, helps you make immutable data um, so you can guarantee that stuff definitely won't change um, no matter what you do to it. So that it, if that works the way I think it does, that sounds brilliant. Um, they've, they've included a completely new date library based on Joda time, which in itself is based on something called Noda time, which is a very highly respected date library for dot, for dot net. Um, Joda time is kind of a port of that. So um, it, it, it basically fixes a lot of the bugs and problems that there are with dates in Java. Uh, it uses immutable date values. So if you want next week, you have to say... Uh, the date I've already got dot next week and it gives you back a new instance which is the one that points at next week instead of modifying the current instance which can cause a great deal of pain uh, apparently there have been lots of updates to cryptography stuff uh, and there's also loads of other stuff there's a lot of stuff in Java 8 so I'm only covering kind of the headlines as I see them uh, uh, one more thing there is a new JavaScript interpreter which I'm very much hoping will be um, 
faster and easier to use than the previous one. If you didn't know, by the way, there is a JavaScript interpreter in Java, and there has been for a number of releases now, um, but they've replaced it with what I hope is a better implementation, hopefully faster and easier to, to use from inside Java code. Anyway, um, it definitely is JavaScript, as you can see from the insane things that happen when you um, type code into it. Like false is equal to the empty string. Uh, okay, so good things about Java 8, as I see it. You can write code in a functional style. You've got a lot more chance of writing stuff that looks like what you would write in um, a functional language including support for immutability, which is really important, because otherwise someone could always just pull the rug out from under you when you're trying to write your immutable code, uh, I mean your functional code. Um, and the replacement of dates is great, because dates have been a real pain point for a long time. And as I say, hopefully JavaScript is less slow, although I haven't tried it, so I can't tell you for sure. Bad things about it. Um, because of the need to support the, the old ways of working, which obviously they do need to do, uh, there's a feeling for me that, uh, that things get dragged down from what they could be. Um, this whole dot stream thing in order to get hold of a stream it seems really awkward. Um, as I've written there, the the fact that all the um, non-class types like int have to have their own versions of all the different things because we've still got that legacy that ints and floats and doubles are not um, not real classes. Um, as with any improvement to a language, that this has been happening in C++ for years, uh, there are now multiple ways to do the same thing, because they, they can't get rid of the old ways because they'll break old code, so they add new stuff that's better, and say, don't use that old stuff. And then you end up with people who are using the old stuff, and it's all a nightmare. Um, also, I I'm just imagine, this isn't going to please the functional people, They've, they're, they're, they're much happier with um, their proper functional language, or even their kind of scary hybrid functional languages like Scala. But equally, this is probably going to upset some people who are quite used to the way Java normally does things. It's, it's asking you to throw out a lot of the stuff that you uh, used to do and do things in this new functional way. Um, so the the, um, uh, the young cool kids are going to be writing code that the, uh, the old grumpy guys don't understand, which is going to annoy them too. Uh, things that are really ugly. There is an attempt to deal with um, tail call optimization. So basically, when you write functional code, you, instead of writing loops, you tend to write um, recursive functions, so functions that call themselves at the end. Uh, and in most uh, proper functional languages, that's quite cheap to do because there's this thing called tail call optimization that means you don't end up filling up the whole memory with all these remembered functions that you're halfway through calling. Um, whereas in Java, if you call a function from within a function hundreds and hundreds of times, you'll eventually run out of memory. There's an attempt to fix that called tail, which looks just horrific. Um, I know that Clojure has quite a neat solution to this. Uh, I don't understand why they didn't use that. Uh, or something a bit like that. Um, but yeah, I think it, there's not that much need to do that much recursion, because the streaming style is actually... Um, it's the new and even cooler way to do functional stuff. So use the streaming style. Don't do a lot of recursion. Or if you do, have a look at this tail thing, which looks horrible. But I haven't looked into it too much. Maybe it's great. Um, and yeah, I, uh, lambdas are actually, in terms of the language, in terms of the way it, um, it, it's understood, they're actually instances of interfaces with just some syntactic sugar, these lambda functions. Um, uh, in terms of the implementation, they're a little bit faster than that, apparently, because they use the invoke dynamic um, stuff that they've added into the virtual machine. So it's maybe not quite as bad as you'd think. But it, basically, they have they haven't really added functions as a first-class thing to the language. All they've done is made it easier to construct instances of interfaces that only have one method, so that they look like they're functions. So I feel sad about that, but maybe it was the only thing they could have done at this stage. Um, okay, so first thing to say, um, have a look at this What's New in Java 8 book on LeanPub, um, which is where I stole most of most of this from. Um, if you uh, like these videos and you want to support me financially, you don't have to, but if you would like to, go to Patreon uh, and look at my page there, maybe donate a dollar for every video I, I make or something like that. Um, if you'd like to support me or you'd like to play a fun game, uh, try playing the 
uh, Android game, Rabbit Escape, that I wrote. It's free to download from the website, or it's 60p if you buy it from the Play Store um, for the same thing. Um, uh, lots more videos on uh, my YouTube page. Follow me on Twitter for videos and blog posts and random things. Hopefully not too much. Uh, follow my blog for information about things I figured out about programming and the videos go on there. If you want to look at the various open source projects um, that I've been working on, have a look at artificialworlds.net. There's a TV guide in there called Free Guide. There's Rabbit Escape. There's um, a template meta programming thing that tries to look like SQL but in C++. There's a Lisp interpreter. There's all kinds of stuff. Have a look on there and see you next time.